So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our short talk this morning on the hindrances to meditation and working with them. So if you were here last week, you may remember that Amala Ketu introduced us to the system of practice in its various stages. And this week, we're going into a little more detail. And we're going to be looking at what is probably quite a common experience for most of us in our meditation, and that is the experience of the hindrances. So what exactly are the hindrances? What do we refer to when we speak of these? Um, well, in broad terms, we could say that they're states of mind. Uh, they're states of mind that affect our meditation that limit our ability to become concentrated, that get in the way of our progress, um, that stop us getting into higher states of consciousness. And in the Buddha's teaching, he identified sort of five broad categories of hindrance that we may be affected by. Um, and these five categories, as you can see, are classed as sense desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, and doubt. So um, they're very nice, precise terms, and uh, it may, but it may not always be uh, in our experience that we see things in quite that way, as clearly as that. It can be quite often when we're meditating um, and something's in the way, something's blocking us, it's just not clear what it is, or it can be difficult to um, put a label to it. Um, so there are various ways of looking at these, um, these, these hindrances and helping us to identify them. And one way in particular that I like comes from um, a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, where the Buddha gave a simile or set of similes for what it's like to experience the hindrances and what it's like to be free of the hindrances. And um, we'll look at what it's like to be free of them towards the end of the talk. But um, so the symbol is for what it's like to be in the grip of the hindrances. Well, the Buddha likened it to looking into a bowl of water with the intention of seeing your, the reflection of your face. So using a bowl of water uh, as a mirror. And for the, uh, the hindrance of sense desire, um, he said that it's like looking into this bowl of water where colored dyes have been poured into the water. So you can't see your reflection. In fact, you probably forget you're even looking for your reflection because you're distracted by the, uh, the beauty of the, the colors and the patterns that the dyes are making in the water. And of course, um, it makes the water completely useless for what uh, its intended purpose was. And similarly with the mind, when we're in the grip of sense desire, uh, we're distracted by these pleasures that crop up in the mind, things that we find enticing, alluring. Um, things that seem to offer us more of a, in the way of an immediate reward than what we're actually trying to be engaged in. And so in that way, we get distracted um, by what we see when we look into the mind. Um, in terms of ill will as a, as a hindrance, um, the Buddha likened that to looking into a pot of boiling water. So instead of a nice mirror surface to the water in which we can see our reflection, um, the water's bubbling and boiling and um, it's agitated. And it's, it's a very apt simile, I think, for, uh, for being in the grip of ill will. I mean, we, we use the term, don't we, boiling with rage. So it's, um, it's, it's very appropriate. Our mind is just so disturbed that there isn't any possibility of any clarity or being settled in any way at all when we're in the grip of ill will. Um, if we move on to sloth and torpor, the next of the hindrances, um, uh, the Buddha likened this to water that is uh, stagnant, choked with algae and weed, a bit like this uh, rather rank looking pond here. Um, our minds can be like that. Um, you know, it's, it's as though movement's completely impossible. There's no clarity, there's no movement, there's no nothing beneficial going on, we may think it's just stagnant water. Um, 
with the nasty smell that comes from that. And, and, and there's no hope of us actually getting anywhere with that. Um, and that can be the experience of sloth and torpor, that our minds are just stagnant. <laughs> I don't think there's probably not another word for it. It just sums it up so, so well. Um, the fourth of the hindrances, restlessness and anxiety. Um, the Buddha likened to the surface of the water in the bowl being disturbed by the wind. Um, a lovely image here of a choppy sea. And uh, how often does our mind feel like this? Uh, that we're thrown about by our worries, our anxieties, our inability to settle down. Um, and all too often, the mind can be in this state. And the, the fifth hindrance, the hindrance of doubt, um, is like water that's muddy, dark. Uh, it's impenetrable. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't see where to go in it. There's no clarity at all. And, and doubt can affect the mind in this way that, you know, we just... We just can't see where to go. We can't see the next step um, because everything around us is so, um, it's just so obscured. So I find these very effective um, ways of looking at the mind, uh, at my mind when I'm in meditation. And sometimes I'm not sure, well, what is the hindrance that I'm trying to deal with here? And it, trying to look at it more in a felt sense of, you know, how does it relate? Um, Am I just being distracted by pretty colours or uh, is my mind boiling with anger or frustration, irritation, or is it just that um, there's no clarity because of doubt, I can't see a way forward. Um, and it, it's a useful tool to have, I think, just, just to help us to uh, identify the hindrance because it's very important that we know what the hindrance is that we're experiencing. If we're not aware of the hindrance or we're not sure what it is, then how do we deal with it? How do we get beyond it? So we need to be able to identify in broad terms um, what it is that's getting in the way of our meditation practice, what it is that's stopping us from uh, moving towards um, higher states of consciousness uh, that, that we can achieve in meditation once the hindrances are removed. Um, and there's a very good analogy, or I, I like the analogy of um, working with the hindrances. It's a bit like playing a game of chess. It's a bit like having a game of chess with your best friend, as it were. So when you're playing against your best friend, you really want to win. I mean, I guess you wouldn't be playing if you didn't want to win. But at the same time, you don't get annoyed if your best friend wins because they are your friend anyway. And it's only a game at the end of the day. But at some point during the game, you may notice that um, some of the moves that uh, you've made were not so skillful and your friend's taken the advantage and your queen's under threat and the game's about to come to an, an abrupt end if you don't do something. So what do you do in those circumstances? Well, you look back, perhaps you look back and you think about where you went wrong. Uh, which move did I do wrong? Oh yeah, a couple of moves ago, instead of doing that, I should have done this. And um, you, you see how you got yourself into this situation. And then you think, well, can I get out of it? What moves do I need to make to get out of this situation? It looks like I'm about to lose the queen all right, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to be prepared to counter in this way or that way. Um, and working with the hindrances can be a bit like that. You know, it's, it's a bit like um, engaging with a mental game with our minds. Um, perhaps taking the hindrances, well, not, not taking them seriously, but not getting so involved with them, not identifying with them not uh, seeing them as my hindrance. You know, this is my hindrance. It belongs to me or I am this hindrance, but just seeing it as a game. The hindrance is something that's come up in the mind. It's arisen because of certain conditions. And if we can look, at, uh, look back at the conditions that gave rise to that hindrance, if we can investigate the hindrance and see, well, what did I do that gave rise to it? Um, then we can work out a strategy for dealing with it, for coping with it. And uh, with practice, just as with chess, we practice, we lose, we practice, we lose, we practice, we lose. Until suddenly we realise that, oh, 
I haven't lost a game for quite a while now. Uh, the practice bears fruit and we're able to we're able to win. So it is with the hindrances. Um, you know, we, we look at how they arose, what brought this hindrance into being? How do I deal with it? Okay, let's try this move. Did it work? No, and we lost the game. Next time the hindrance arise, well, that didn't work last time. Let me try something else this time. And if we keep working with the hindrances in that way, with patience, um, almost with a sense of playfulness, um, and certainly not getting caught up in a sense of failure uh, when we, we don't manage to uh, win the game with the hindrance, um, there's always going to be another game. Every time we sit down to meditate, we're engaging in a game with the hindrances. Um, so if we can work with them in that way, playfully um, and not judgmentally, we stand a good chance of learning how to deal with them, how to work with them. So the hindrance is just something that's arisen in the mind and it requires us to take the appropriate action to get beyond it. So what might that action be? Well, there, there are various ways of dealing with the hindrances. There are various uh, traditional teachings with dealing with the hindrances. And I'm just going to give an example of um, a couple of ways of working with the hindrance this morning. Um, time doesn't permit to go through all of the various ways and you'd probably fall asleep anyway if I did try to go through all the ways of dealing with the hindrance. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of ways of working with the hindrance. So first of all, if the, wind, if the hindrance is quite weak um, and, and they come in a variety of strengths, as I'm sure you're aware from your own experience, if you're experiencing a fairly weak hindrance, then just being mindful that it's there can often be enough to remove it. Mindfulness itself can be the condition that works against the hindrance and helps you to get beyond it. Of course, mindfulness has to be there to some degree anyway, to even be aware that the hindrance is present. So I find that quite encouraging that um, being aware of the hindrance means that there is some mindfulness present, that I've not totally lost my mindfulness. Um, if you totally lost the mindfulness, you wouldn't know the hindrance was there. You'd just be swept up in it and that would be it. No more game for today. But um, being aware that we are experiencing the hindrance is a mindful activity in itself. Um, and we can work on that. We can build on that degree of mindfulness. So just noticing the hindrance and turning our attention to it. Oh, oh, I'm experiencing some ill will here. It can, can be enough if it's a weak hindrance to dissolve it. It will just change. Um, if it's a stronger hindrance, if it's got more of a grip on our mind, then we need to try and look at uh, some of the conditions that gave rise to it. We need to try to understand where the hindrance came from. Why has this a hindrance arisen in the mind? Um, you know, which moves did I make that opened up uh, the mind to the hindrance? And which moves can I make that will help overcome it? That help win the day. So we're just going to go through the uh, the five hindrances, looking at ways of working with them individually. Um, so with sense desire, again, we're assuming that mindfulness isn't enough to remove it. Awareness of it isn't enough to remove it. It's stronger. So we need to look at the conditions that gave rise to this hindrance of sense desire. And there'll almost certainly be somewhere in there a pleasant feeling that arose. Um, if we're in meditation, that pleasant feeling may have come from the body. It's probably more likely to come from the mind. It will be a thought, an idea, a memory, a fantasy that arose in the mind and attached to that was a pleasant feeling. And that drew us in. You know, maybe, uh, maybe just remembering the last holiday we went on as we, we sit here in, in the sunshine meditating and the pleasant uh, event that that was draws us into that experience and bringing it back to mind. And we're enjoying what we're doing. We're enjoying the memory or we're enjoying the ideas that we're thinking about. Um, so that's a, a mental pleasant feeling, um, which gives which is a sense desire on the mental level. Of course, outside of meditation and sometimes within meditation, it can come through any of the senses. It can be something we've seen, something we hear, something we're in contact with. Any of the sense doors, as we call them, any, any of our physical senses can give rise to pleasure 
which becomes a hindrance because we get absorbed in it, we get distracted by it. Um, one way of dealing with this is to reflect on the impermanence of pleasant feelings. Uh, all things are impermanent, pleasant feelings are not an exception to this. Uh, and if we can see the impermanent nature of these pleasant feelings, if we can just watch the feeling arise, see it, its duration, and then watch it pass away again, as it will do, if we don't feed it with energy, it won't grow, it'll just pass away. So we can undermine that tendency to get caught up in pleasure through the senses, uh, just by being aware of the impermanent nature of that experience. Um, and if that still doesn't work, then you know, we can start to look at or reflect on the, the inherent unsatisfactoriness in whatever it was that gave rise to the pleasant experience. Um, we can look up on its characteristics. We call them the three lakshanas, the three characteristics of conditioned experience, which is that they are impermanent, unsatisfactory and uh, void of self-nature. So we can reflect on that. We can reflect on um, the fact that uh, you know, this experience will eventually lead to unsatisfactoriness. Um, it already has, in a sense, that we're uh, we're suffering from the uh, from the experience of the hindrance. We don't want to be engaged with the hindrance. So already the the pleasant sense experience has has led to some degree of unsatisfactoriness. Um, we may notice through looking at the conditions that gave rise to this experience that perhaps there's something we need to change in the way we, we conduct our lives. You know, maybe um, watching box sets and movies on Netflix until late at night isn't a good idea if we want to meditate in the morning. Um, watching what we fill our minds with, what we're feeding our minds with, uh, being careful of uh, where we let the mind wander. Um, can be a way of guarding against sense experience. Um, not advocating that we deny all pleasure or happiness in our lives. Buddhism doesn't, de doesn't deny the existence or even the necessity of pleasure. It's part of our makeup in many ways. But it's where we turn to for that pleasure that's important. And trying to, as it were, refine the sources of our pleasure moving away from uh, the coarser pleasures of simply stimulating the senses to perhaps through uh, appreciation of, um, of the arts, aesthetic appreciation, deriving pleasure from the natural world and moving towards the more refined pleasures of the meditation experience itself, um, the joy and bliss that arises from the higher states of consciousness. And of course, ultimately, of course, the uh, the pure and uninterrupted bliss of nirvana, of the state of enlightenment, of being free from all attachments to worldly things. So there is this progression, this hierarchy of sources of pleasure. Um, and in order to move up that, as it were, that ladder of pleasure, uh, we need to be able to see the pleasure that is available on the higher level before we can step off the lower level. You can't climb a ladder by just stepping off the rung you're on you've got to reach for the rung above you as well. And so it is with pleasure. Um, it's not that we have to give up all sources of pleasure, but just try to move towards a more refined um, sense or a source of our pleasure. So if our sense, if our hindrance is uh, anger, is ill will, um, and mindfulness of that ill will, that anger isn't enough to, uh, to remove it. Then again, we can look at the, um, the impermanent nature of unpleasant feelings, because the source of our anger will be somewhere an unpleasant feeling. Um, you know, someone may have said something or done something that gave rise to an unpleasant feeling um, that upset us. And from that arises the anger. So again, if we can look at the impermanent nature of those unpleasant feelings that uh, underpin the anger, that may help to diffuse it. Or we can look at, well, why are we reacting angrily to whatever this stimulus was? Um, generally, one could say that uh, if something's made us angry, it's because it's challenged or seemingly threatened something which we rely on to identify our sense of self with. 
perhaps uh, an idea, a view, an opinion that we hold. Um, someone has challenged that, has questioned it, has maybe even contradicted it. And we feel that as uh, an attack on our personal identity. And that, in a way, that makes us angry, that triggers our anger. So working with that, perhaps we can see, well, what is this personal identity that we feel is under threat? Where does that come from? Is that really there? Are these views of mine really true? And uh, why do I hold on to them? Why do I identify with them? If we look at their ever-changing nature, um, we can see that there's nothing really there to hold on to. But of course, we put an awful lot of effort and energy into holding on to our views and into building up a, a framework to support our views and to uh, support our identity through those views um, that we feel that our very, uh, our very existence could be under threat when our views are challenged. But if we can see through um, those, this delusion of a permanent structure that we call ourselves, and, and see through to the ever-changing nature of all of our experience, um, then there's nothing for the, uh, for the anger to fasten onto because there is no threat to me that can threaten me when me is simply an ever-changing flux of experience based on conditions. So we can look at the impermanent nature of ourselves, um, which removes the target for, the, uh, for the, that sense of hurt that sense of a challenged ego, um, that it can no longer be touched by um, simply having a view that we hold questioned. And of course, we can also work with metta, uh, a very good antidote to anger, working with developing loving kindness, both on and off the cushions. It can um, reduce, soften, and eventually eliminate that tendency to get angry in the first place. Um, with sloth and torpor, um, again, if mindfulness of the sloth and torpor isn't enough to alleviate it, then we can contemplate the pleasure from being in the present moment. We can look for the joy of being in the present moment as a way of ri uh, giving rise to inspiration that can lead to energy to overcome the hindrance of sloth and torpor. Um, if that doesn't work, if we need a bit more, then we perhaps turn our contemplations to uh, the fact that our life is impermanent and we haven't got time to waste in laziness, if that's the cause of our sloth and torpor, something I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, always put off until tomorrow what you don't have to do today. Well, actually, we can't guarantee tomorrow, so it's better to get it done today rather than put it off. So if it's laziness that gives rise to our sloth and torpor, then just a simple reflection on the impermanent nature of everything that makes us up may help there. Of course, sloth and torpor may just be due to the fact that we are physically tired and we need a rest, in which case have a rest. But there could be a tendency to um, use that as justification for just not wanting to be bothered. So we need to look at our motivation we need to look at what's inspiring us um, to find our inspiration in something that can break us out of that sloth and torpor, to see the value in what it is that we're trying to do and the importance of it. And the final one, restlessness and worry. Oh, sorry, it's not the final one, the, the, the fourth one. With restlessness and worry, well, anything that helps to calm the mind, of course, will help with this, um, and particularly relaxing into whole body awareness just becoming aware of our body. Um, engaging with the breath can help to calm us. Just relaxing, particularly on each out breath, letting go of whatever it is that we're holding on to. Um, and um, yeah, just working with um, this, this sense of being unsettled. Uh, again, not having too much going on in our lives can help to calm the mind um, as, as practical things to do outside of meditation. Um, making sure that we've done what needs to be done before we meditate can uh, remove the tendency towards uh, anxiety and worrying about things that, that, uh, that we haven't done. Um, and just surrounding ourselves with as settled an environment as, as we possibly can. To, to help with this sense of restlessness, of doubt, doing whatever we can to calm those rest, those choppy waters. 
Um, and with doubt, we move on to the last one. Um, this doubt that um, clouds, uh, clouds our mind and uh, uh, means that we can't see where to go, what to do. Well, we need to build up a sense of self-reliance. Um, we need to build up a, a confidence and an awareness that we can do this. Um, and that we do through engaging with the practice and through paying attention to what we're doing in the practice and just noticing those occasions when the practice actually really does work for us. Um, to go back to the chess game, just noticing when we've made a move that it actually improved our position and taking confidence from that, taking confidence from each occasion that we see a benefit from the practice. Um, each, each time that we notice we've made a little step forward and that can help to remove this sense of doubt. Um, but of course, a big thing with doubt is that we need commitment. Uh, we need to be committed. If, if we're not prepared to make a commitment, um, then the doubt will simply remain. Um, it's not that we can sit on the fence. So um, deciding not to choose to follow the path is the same as choosing not to follow the path. It's actually a decision, although we, we may shroud it in uh, other terms. Oh, I'm just keeping my options open for a while. I'll just see what else might come along. I'll, 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 I'll hold this in the background. I won't commit to it. We're actually making a choice there. We're deciding not to do it, although we don't want to admit that to ourselves um, because of this, uh, the effect of this doubt and uh, the indecision that arises from it. So it's, yeah, it's looking for where the practice has worked for us and being prepared to make that step, to make that commitment uh, to, to progress in, in the path and, and not to just waste time. Um, because as I said with the, uh, the previous hindrance, you know, we don't have the time to waste. We don't know how much time is available to us. And we may find that we've wasted all of our time and still never made a decision to do anything definite to make a commitment. So if we work with the hindrances like this, um, eventually there will be a time when we can meditate and there will be no hindrances. The mind will be free of the hindrances. And this is a, an occasion for great joy. This is uh, opening the doorway to higher states of consciousness, something that we'll be talking about next week. Um, but I'd just like to conclude with uh, the Buddha's uh, similes for what it feels like to when the hindrances are no longer there. So when we've calmed the mind, when we've settled the mind, uh, when, if you like, the, uh, the bowl of water is still and like a mirror in which we can see our reflection. And the Buddha said to be free of sense desire feels like having paid off a great debt. If you can imagine if you've ever been in debt, to be free of debt is a huge relief. It's, it's a massive relief when, well, even perhaps when the mortgage is paid off, you know, that sense that now you're not tied to that debt. Um, ill will, uh, the Buddha likened to having recovered from a disease. So anger is a disease, um, which you can see if you break the word disease down, it's dis and ease, dis-ease. And anger is very, you know, we're not at ease when we're angry. So when we recover, when we go beyond the hindrance of ill will, it's like we've recovered from that dis-ease. Overcoming sloth and torpor is like being released from prison. That sense of freedom. You can see the, the clear blue sky again instead of the gray walls surrounding you. Restlessness and anxiety, being freed from slavery. So not being tied to something, not being at the beck and call of something other than what we want to do. Uh, a very good analogy there for, for restlessness and anxiety, being a slave to these, uh, these winds that blow us about. And being free from doubt is like completing a dangerous journey. You know, a journey that we weren't sure about. We weren't sure we could trust the guide. Did the guide know, really know the route? Were they just leading us into some perilous situation? Would we ever get there? Was there a destination to get to in the first place? And then when we complete the journey, uh, when we go beyond that doubt, we can see that yes, the guide was to be trusted. And yes, there was a destination that was worth making the journey for. So I think these are great encouragement for, uh, for working with the hindrances, you know, the, the, these ideas of what it feels like to be free of them. If we're not free of them, 
um, then this gives us an idea of what we're aiming at, what we're looking to, to get to in our meditation practice. And yes, they may come back again. They almost certainly will come back again. Uh, being free of the hindrances uh, isn't the end of the road, um, but it's, it's a great place to be in um, from time to time and to spend more and more time in as we learn how to, how to work with them and how to overcome them. We learn to uh, be creative with our minds. So I'm gonna leave it there um, because we have, uh, we have our discussion groups to go to now. So thank you all very much.